I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor. And I'm Dan Barker. We're co-presidents of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Our guest today is Amanda Tyler. She's executive director of the Baptist Joint Committee for Religious Liberty and leader of Christians Against Christian Nationalism. The Freedom From Religion Foundation, which produces Free Thought Matters, is the nation's largest association of free thinkers, that's atheists, agnostics, and other non-believers. We invite you to join us in our vital work to keep our secular government free from religious influence. Become a member at ffrf.org or ask for a complimentary copy of our newspaper, Free Thought Today. Freedom depends on free thinkers. Watch prior episodes of Free Thought Matters on FFRF's YouTube channel. We're very pleased to be joined today by Amanda Tyler. She's the executive director of the Baptist Joint Committee for Religious Liberty. She's a co-host of the Respecting Religion podcast and is a member of the Texas and the U.S. Supreme Court Bar. Amanda helped oversee a blockbuster joint report issued by the Baptist Joint Committee and by the Freedom From Religion Foundation, to which she contributed a chapter about Christian responses to Christian nationalism after January 6th. Welcome to Free Thought Matters, Amanda. Oh, I'm so pleased to be on. Thanks for having me, Dan and Annie Lurie. It's good to see you again. So uh, when a lot of our viewers hear the, the word Baptist, they might think Southern Baptists or conservatives, they may not conjure up a person who strongly supports the separation of religion and government. But in fact, uh, the Baptists historically have been some of the most ardent defenders of religious liberty and of state church separation. Isn't that true? That's absolutely true. And it is a sad commentary that unfortunately, Baptists aren't as readily associated with religious freedom for all and how that's best protected by separating the institutions of government and religion. Um, Baptists have been for religious freedom for all since our beginnings. The Baptist movement started in the early 17th century in England, and one of our earliest uh, Baptists, Thomas Helwes, wrote what is considered to be the first defense of universal religious freedom in the English language. And of course, Roger Williams uh, mm -hmm. also spent some time as a Baptist and founded the first Baptist Church of America, and he was a staunch defender of religious freedom and thought that the government should remain neutral when it comes to religion, um, based on his own experience of being persecuted by the established church and also seeing the uh, established church and the colonies discriminating against others, including his uh, Native American brothers and sisters. So th there was a lot of persecution of Baptists in, in colonial America, wasn't there? There was. Uh, Baptists were not the established religion in any of the colonies, and so Baptists often found themselves in a dissenting role on the wrong side of uh, government persecution when it comes to religion. I I'm speaking mostly, uh, of course, about a history of white Baptists. We also have to think, of course, of our uh, if people who were enslaved at the time and all of the persecution that they suffered and taking away of their freedom as well as their religious freedom. So Baptists come at this issue uh, from an experiential position of being a persecuted minority uh, and also from a theological position of understanding the importance of freedom from state authority in order to pursue religious freedom. Well, so, and of course there was a very famous split. The Southern Baptists split off from other Baptists purely um, on the issue of slavery, were pro-slavery. That's, 
That's right. The Southern Baptist Convention, I, I believe, dates to 1845, and it was that split um, that split Baptists in the United States into Northern and Southern Baptists on that very issue. Um, and so, but even after that split, I think even the Southern Baptist Convention continued to understand the importance of religious freedom for all. And for, for many uh, decades after that split, continued to support the concept of the importance of the separation of state and church. Um, and uh, it's really a more of a modern uh, phenomenon that that has not been as as thoroughly part of their uh, understanding of religious freedom. But I think it's important for viewers of the program to understand the, the wide diversity of Baptist experience in the Baptist movement. Baptist Joint Committee for Religious Liberty is supported by 16 different Baptist denominations. Um, I bet a lot of people didn't know there were 16 different Baptist denominations. They don't agree on everything, but they all agree on the importance of religious freedom for all. And they continue to think that that is best uh, protected by the separation of the institutions of religion and government. I remember when I was a, a Christian minister, I used to feel like you, that there should be no coercion. The government should not be pushing or opposing, that each person should be free to say yes or no on their own merits. And um, I was surprised to see, or maybe I shouldn't have been surprised to see, that like us, you opposed that, that huge Bladensburg Christian cross in, in Maryland. And... Why would Baptists not want to see a large cross on public property? Well, uh, we saw that as what I think it clearly is, is a violation of the Establishment Clause and those principles that government will stay neutral when it comes to religion. Uh, but our brief in that case, we often file friend of the court briefs at the Supreme Court, our brief uh, responded to a particularly egregious argument that the government was making in that case. You know, in their zeal to keep that cross on government property, the government was making the argument that the cross is a secular symbol. They said the cross is not a religious symbol. It's a, a generic symbol of sacrifice. And we, along with a number of other Christian and uh, Jewish groups, filed a brief saying that that is deeply offensive to us. That's offensive to Christians to say that the cross doesn't have any religious significance. And it's also offensive to non-Christians who also clearly see the cross as a religious symbol. And I think that's an excellent example of what happens with Christian nationalism um, and the dangers that that poses uh, to Christianity, that uh, once the government tries to appropriate Christian symbols as their own, they also strip those symbols of religious significance. That's a violation of religious freedom. And we felt like it was important to raise that point to the Supreme Court. Um, and it's a point that was commented on uh, from, by the justices at the bench and also in a dissenting opinion um, that explained, um, again, what the religious significance of the cross is. I never thought we would have to defend the religious significance of the cross to the Supreme Court, and yet that's where we are uh, right now in this, in this jurisprudence before this court. So, Amanda, you brought up Christians Against Christian Nationalism, and this is an initiative that you lead. So, a lot of people don't know what Christian nationalism, can, can you define it and, and why should Christians be opposed to it? Yeah, so we define Christian nationalism as a political ideology and cultural framework that seeks to merge the identities of Americans and Christians. Of course, there are millions of Christian Americans in this country, but those terms are not synonymous and redundant. Um, one does not have to be Christian to be a true American, and yet that's what Christian nationalism says. Uh, Christian nationalism is, of course, an urgent threat to American democracy and to the promise of religious freedom for all, to the, to the protection um, that we get from the separation of the institutions of religion and government. But it's an, also a threat to Christianity itself. I explained one example of that when the government appropriates Christian symbols as their own and therefore strips them of religious significance. Um, but for Christians as well, Christian nationalism can lead to idolatry, um, can lead to a confusion 
of allegiances to religion and political authority in a way uh, that really can threaten our our walk with God, our religious convictions. And so three years ago, BJC, along with some of our ecumenical partners, launched a project called Christians Against Christian Nationalism. And it's available at christiansagainstchristiannationalism.org. And in that uh, project, we provide a platform for Christians to take a public stand against Christian nationalism. But there are resources that anyone can use to learn more about Christian nationalism. And also, we hope that allies can point to our project to show, you know, it is not anti-Christian to call out Christian nationalism, quite the opposite. Many of these Christians think it's vital to the preservation of our faith to root out and dismantle Christian nationalism. Yeah, and that is so important because there is that tendency to think, oh, if you, crit if you criticize Christian nationalism, are you criticizing Christianity? And they are totally different things. Yeah. That's right. You know, unfortunately, sometimes, Christianity itself in, in the American context has become so infected by Christian nationalism that it can be difficult to tell the difference. Um, but we are trying to explain the difference between Christian nationalism and Christianity and again, and to take that argument away, that to oppose Christian nationalism is not to be anti-Christian, far from it. And we have an open platform of nearly 25,000 Christians who have taken that public stand, um, who can be called on um, to be voices in in this broader societal effort we have to dismantle Christian nationalism. So you've partnered with other ecumenical groups on this project, but you've also partnered with us, the Baptist right. and the Freedom From Religion Foundation to produce this, this document, this report about January the 6th. And we want to talk about that in a minute, but, but could you first tell us, is there a difference between white Christian nationalism and Christian nationalism? Yeah, I think that white Christian nationalism, which is quite prevalent, in fact, probably the most prevalent kind of Christian nationalism we see in the United States, and certainly the most dangerous, is uh, explains the ways that Christian nationalism often provides cover for white supremacy and racial subjugation. You know, Christian nationalism heavily relies on this false narrative of the United States being found as a quote unquote Christian nation. Of course, the United States was also founded on the institution of slavery um, and race-based segregation and all of, um, all of the horrors that go along with that. And so to say that God had some kind of providential role for the United States in that history also suggests that God would endorse slavery, that God would endorse segregation, and these kinds of deeply embedded narratives that often are very difficult um, to, to unseat. This is part of white Christian nationalism. And so the language of white Christian nationalism provides uh, all of this coded language that allows racism to go a little bit more under the surface, um, and it can become even more difficult to dislodge it from our society. You know, like what Abraham Lincoln said, that the Bible was used on both sides of that debate about abolition by the North and by the South. And in January 6th, we saw a lot of those images. We saw a, a, a Christian flag, we saw crosses, and we saw Confederate flags also combined. To what degree is racism a factor among Christian nationalists, do you think? Oh, I think it's a big factor. You know, the Christian in Christian nationalism is much more about identity than it is about religion. It carries with it all kinds of assumptions about nativism and white supremacy. Um, and again, it's it's coded. It's not as overt as some explicitly racist language, but it talks about a sense of belonging. It suggests that to truly belong in the United States, you have to be a certain kind of Christian, often a white Christian. And so that sends a signal of exclusion um, that is not found, again, in our founding documents in the way that uh, we said that citizenship would be equal regardless of our religious convictions. Um, we know, of course, how the United States has failed to live up to those ideals over the years. Um, we're recording this right when the first black woman uh, to ever serve on the United States Supreme Supreme Court has been confirmed. Um, and so we know that we are making progress in this idea of full inclusion and full belonging in the in the country. 
white Christian nationalism threatens that progress. It continues with this narrative of exclusion that only certain people belong. Um, and so that is another reason that it's so important that we dismantle and call out and learn to recognize Christian nationalism as another form of racism in our society. So when we come back, we want to talk about the Christian nationalist roots of the January 6th insurrection and the report about it that the Baptist Joint Committee and FFRF Co. coordinated and about the chapter that you wrote in it that is called The Christian Responses to Christian Nationalism After January 6th. Hi, I'm Ron Reagan, an unabashed atheist. When I first recorded that commercial back in 2014, being openly atheist in America was still fairly uncommon. Today, the fastest growing religious group in the country is the non-religious, especially among the young. That progress is heartening, but the religious pushback is fierce and the forces of Christian nationalism are well organized. Our progress won't continue unless we work together so that reason and our secular constitution will prevail. That's why I'm asking you to join the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest and most effective association of atheists and agnostics working to keep state and church separate, just like our founders intended. Please join the Freedom From Religion Foundation today. Ron Reagan, lifelong atheist, not afraid of burning in hell. And welcome back. We're continuing our conversation with Amanda Tyler, the executive director of the Baptist Joint Committee for Religious Liberty. And that committee and the Freedom from Religion Foundation co-produced a report about Christian nationalism at the January 6th insurrection. And so, Amanda, you authored one of the chapters. You helped oversee the whole project. I want to first ask you, how did you feel when you saw Christian symbols and Christian signs at the January 6th riot? Well, I, I was deeply hurt by it, honestly. I was outraged, um, saddened, uh, and the, the insurrection itself, you know, as someone who lives in Washington, as someone who has worked for a member of Congress, was shocking beyond belief to me um, on the day of and, and for many weeks later. And the idea that these insurrectionists would try to cloak their indefensible actions in the name of Jesus was outrageous to me. Um, and I commented on it at the time. Um, it was something that was immediately recognizable. Uh, but then with uh, the weeks that came and the more reporting that came, it it really showed that this was not just a few actors who had brought their Bibles or their uh, crosses or their Christian flags to the insurrection. There was something much more pervasive going on uh, in the insurrection. And so I was really pleased to get to work with your team at FFRF to uh, research and understand the role that Christian nationalism played in the insurrection. So you've written that there are times when Christians must lead efforts that call out Christian nationalism in a self-critical way. And I'm wondering what kind of responses you've gotten to your role in this report, your chapter, everything you've spoken out against uh, Christian nationalism, uh, especially since January 6th. Yeah. Well, I will say, you know, for one thing, that Christian nationalism and calling out Christian nationalism is very closely related to Baptist Joint Committee's mission of defending and extending religious freedom for all. I think that the single best antidote to the poison of Christian nationalism is a recommitment to the principles of religious freedom for all, including the principles of state church separation. And so I would say that our, our closest supporters, those who have watched BJC for a number of years, BJC is an 86-year-old organization, they understand the problem with Christian nationalism. They are cheering us on as we take it on head on. Um, there are, of course, some detractors. Um, I think that those detractors are those who are most influenced by Christian nationalism itself, those ambassadors of Christian nationalism. So I won't say that we have received no pushback, but I would say that the majority of responses that we have gotten to Christians are 
expressions of gratitude of thank you for putting a name for this. Thank you for raising the profile. Thanks for providing resources so that we can better understand Christian nationalism. That piece of self-criticism that you mentioned, I think that that is so critical because what we're doing at, at Baptist Joint Committee and what we're doing with Christians Against Christian Nationalism, we are, of course, calling out the most egregious examples, including that what happened on January 6th. But we are also calling on people to more fully understand how Christian nationalism is present even in their own congregations. How the presence, for example, of an American flag in a sanctuary space is an example of Christian nationalism coming right into the house of worship. And so before, we, we aren't about pointing fingers at other people. We're about understanding how Christian nationalism is part of the American experience so that we can more readily understand it, question some of these deeply um, held assumptions and and assumptions that have gone on unquestioned for so long. That's how Christian nationalism has become so pervasive. I think that helps us when we're calling out Christian nationalism in other circles to say that we're looking at ourselves as well and that we have the tools in our theology, in our religious study to do that. That's why one of the resources at Christians Against Christian Nationalism is a three-part discussion guide uh, based on the Bible, on Bible um, resources that small groups of Christians can use to understand Christian nationalism and distinguish it from Christianity as well. Well, because Christianity, it, it's not a, a country. Christianity is, is a faith. And, and there's, Christians don't all agree with each other on everything. And I understand that it's not just liberal Christians and liberal believers who are opposed to Christian nationalism, but also some conservatives, some evangelical leaders are also calling out their rioters. Isn't that correct? Absolutely. You know, Christians Against Christian Nationalism, it's a grassroots collective of individuals who are concerned about Christian nationalism. And we've analyzed our list of, of signers, and in looking at how they have self-identified on the list, we have identified more than six dozen different denominations of Christians. So this is not just a you know, progressive Christian response to Christian nationalism. This cuts across theological, ideological, even political lines of Christians who might view different matters of moral concern, um, different political or partisan issues differently, but they are united in their concern about Christian nationalism. We crafted the centerpiece of the Christians Against Christian Nationalism project is a statement that has eight unifying principles. Uh, principles like people of all faiths and none have the right and responsibility to engage constructively in the public square, and that one's uh, rights of citizenship should not be contingent upon one's religious beliefs. These are core values of state church separation, core values of religious freedom for all that can unite people no matter what particular church they might belong to. And we've seen that these statements have united people, that this is this cuts across um, a broad cross-section of American Christian life, people who have signed this statement. So should I read the statement? I think there's eight parts to it. Sure. People of all faiths and none have the right and responsibility to engage constructively in the public square. Patriotism does not require us to minimize our religious convictions. One's religious affiliation or lack thereof should be irrelevant to one's standing in the civic community. Government should not prefer one religion over another or religion over non-religion. Religious instruction is best left to our houses of worship, other religious institutions, and families. America's historic commitment to religious pluralism enables faith communities to live in civic harmony with one another without sacrificing our theological convictions. Conflating religious authority with political authority is idolatrous and often leads to oppression of minority and other marginalized groups, as well as the spiritual impoverishment of religion. We must stand up to and speak out against Christian nationalism, especially when it inspires acts of violence and intimidation, including vandalism, bomb threats, arson, hate crimes, and attacks on houses of worship, 
against religious communities at home and abroad. So those are great principles. Right, and those are the principles that a broad section of Christians have all been able to agree with. You know, that that last uh, bullet point you read, the one about violence, I want to point out that this statement was published in July 2019, so a full 18 months before the attack on the Capitol. But we had seen examples of violent Christian nationalism even before January 6th. Examples like at Mother Emanuel AME Church in Charleston in 2015 and the Tree of Life Synagogue shooting in 2018. And it were these examples of just how violent and deadly Christian nationalism can be that really urged us to put this project forward. And so we were, you know, in a way grateful that we had this project already going when January 6th happened, it gave people a place to focus. Again, people who had maybe not noticed or been concerned about Christian nationalism before, after January 6th, after seeing those instances of Christian nationalism at the Capitol, they were looking for resources. They wanted to understand it, and we were there ready to provide those resources to help them understand Christian nationalism. So it was very prescient of you to create this group, Amanda, and we only have a minute left So what's the answer? What can people do to oppose Christian nationalism? Well, I think, you know, it is to not be overwhelmed by the by the scale of the problem. Christian nationalism is deeply embedded, pervasive. And one of the reasons it has been allowed to fester for so long is generations not standing up against it by accepting some of these deeply seated narratives. And so I think we are given an opportunity because of the wake up call that we got on January 6th about how dangerous Christian nationalism is to our democracy, that we can join together across religious differences, just like BJC and FFRF did in the publishing of this report, to understand Christian nationalism, to understand that what unites us is so much more than what divides us. And what unites us is a common commitment to religious freedom for all, to the freedom to say yes and no to religion. And I think joining in with each other, having difficult conversations, getting the information we need to stand up against Christian nationalism, that will be key to our success to ultimately dismantling it. Yes, and it requires a very strict separation between religion and government to ensure that liberty. We're very grateful to work with you, Amanda, and for everything you've done and for joining us today. Oh, I'm grateful for our partnership. Thanks for having me on. And thank you for watching Free Thought Matters. Because free thought matters. Hi, I'm Steve Pinker. In my book, Enlightenment Now, I show that the world has become a better place as reason has been overcoming superstition and tribalism. But the values of the Enlightenment are under attack. That's why I'm a proud member of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest association of free thinkers working to keep state and church separate. Please join me in supporting the Freedom From Religion Foundation to ensure that our government is driven not by religion, but by reason.